Aussie actor and director Mel Collinsale Gerard Gibson is one of our biggest Hollywood success stories. So you'll be surprised to discover that he was actually born in New York. One of 11 children, it wasn't until he was 12 that his family moved to Australia and he was forced to develop an Australian accent after he was teased at school for his American twang. Although earlier on he considered pursuing cooking or journalism, he caught the acting bug and attended the prestigious drama college NIDA, where he became roommates with fellow actor Geoffrey Rush. After graduating, he landed a few bit roles on stage and TV, but it was his breakout role as the leather-clad, post-apocalyptic warrior hero Mad Max that made him a hot rising star. Imagine that you're 20, early 20s and all of a sudden you're in the star of these films and you haven't had that up till then your whole life and things start to change pretty rapidly. With so much pressure at such a young age, it's hardly surprising that Mel needed a little time out to regroup. I took a long time off. I think, you know, you just need to recharge your batteries a bit. And uh, I just went away. You might start to believe what image has been created about you. I mean, you have to find out who you are really and then uh, approach everything else from that viewpoint. Peter Weir then cast him in Gallipoli. His powerful performance proved Mel was a serious actor and helped him land an American agent. Mad Max 2 Road Warrior was his first hit in the States, bringing him international fame while he gained more critical acclaim for the year of living dangerously. But perhaps his most well-known role was as Martin Riggs in the legendary Lethal Weapon series. Hey, what? Hey, Rick, you think... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I just wanted to see if you'd do it. <laughs> Moving behind the camera, in 1993 he made his directorial debut in The Man Without a Face, in which he also acted. The film received critical acclaim and Mel too was happy with his work. I am proud of it. I, it's the best I could do it at the time. And, and, uh, you know, and it's got its faults. Every film has flaws. You know, and, and this one certainly does too. And it, but I think... Uh, not that many. In 1995, Mel took on the epic story of the sword-wielding, kilt-wearing Scottish freedom fighter William Wallace in Braveheart, my favourite Mel film. Would you believe, though, he almost turned down the role believing he was too old for it, asking the producers if he could direct instead. They compromised and agreed he could direct if he played William. And the move paid off, with Braveheart winning both the Best Director and Best Picture Oscars. Mel found he really connected with the legendary character of William Wallace. I just found him to be very magnetic, a remarkable person. It's very interesting to sort of go back to something primal as that in the 13th century. And, um, you know, before they had blenders and toasters and telephones and uh, uh, explore the reality of um, how life must have been and how people must have been and how, the, how their minds worked in another whole time, another whole thought, way of thought existed back then, I'm sure. So, uh, you know, it's always intensely interesting, that kind of process. I mean, there's just a lot of elements that you had to get together and make, um, bring into some kind of harmony so that you could film it and film it the way you wanted to see it. A film of mammoth proportions with a huge cast and epic fight scenes, Braveheart was a very challenging film to direct. It's a series of logistical puzzles that you have to go about solving with the help of other people with expertise, you know, to get an image up there which can be very difficult sometimes, but there is a pleasure in it. You, as you say, there's, is there fun in it? Yeah, well, there is. Um, I do enjoy it. Not without its moments of ripping your hair out, though. Uh, nothing like a challenge to scare the hell out of you, you know. Uh, helps you grow, I guess. Mill thrives on the challenges and creative freedom he receives while directing. His passion for the craft also inspires others. Mel is just an inspiration. Um, you know, I, I, I theorized that after making 50 trillion movies, uh, an actor would become somewhat calloused or, or dead to the process in a sense. But uh, Mel completely proved that theory wrong. Um, he just has such, such drive um, and such passion for um, his, his work. You have a, a much wider range of expression uh, when you're directing because you really are um, displaying your vision as far as you can on film. Uh, as an actor, you can you participate in that and you try and acquaint yourself with the vision of the director, but it really is a, it's the overview. It's the whole texture and um, momentum and, and everything about the story. I mean, it's yours. You have to try new fields and try and stretch here and there and, and maybe go back to the other one and do it better than the last time you did it. Or, mm. You know, so long as it keeps you interested and alive and creative and uh, doing things well, 
as you can perceive them. They might be rotten, but so long as you're having a great time. After Braveheart, Mel once again returned to focus on acting, starring in films like Conspiracy Theory and Payback. However, he found his role in Ransom, the story of a child kidnapping, especially challenging. It was a little little step in, in acting, I think. I just felt like I stretched out a little. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was quite good. It was a tough job, actually. It was different from other things you did before. Yeah. Well, of course, you bring a lot of baggage with you, you know. Um, there are certain things that you're known for, that you have a forte at, and, and uh, the, that... Um, so you can never escape that baggage. I mean, there's the, the face. You can't get away from your own face. You can't get away... You could, I mean, with prosthetics and stuff, but, you know, I, that's not what it's about. It's about changing the inner... You know, putting on the inner guy. In 2000, Mel acted in three films that each grossed over $100 million. The Patriot, Chicken Run and What Women Want. The latter proving Mel also had a gift for comedy. I, I think that something like The Road Warrior was humorous. I think I thought that that was yeah. comedy. But a different kind of comedy. It was a little darker, a little blacker comedy. But it, yeah, I, it, I was given a great deal of scope to kind of play with eccentricities and and to fool with expectations, which is, of course, the essence of comedy, to set one thing up and then do another. Even his co-stars agree he's a funny guy, although on the set of The Conspiracy Theory, Julia Roberts wasn't such a fan of Mel's wicked sense of humour. But can you blame her? Yeah, I gave her a rat. But I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with that. I mean, uh, I, um, it was dead. I mean, she doesn't have to feed it or buy a cage or anything. She can just, like, leave it around. And he doesn't just torment his co-stars. In press interviews, he can also be quite the cheeky prankster. I'm more relaxed, yeah. yeah. I'm Good always relaxed. Yeah. I'm almost ready to go. I'm so <laughs> relaxed. I'm really relaxed. Mm. Don't cook sausages in the nude. Don't know. <laughs> Ten dollars a kiss, right? <laughs> the box office hits continued with We Were Soldiers and Signs. But Mel's biggest gamble, both financially and artistically, was The Passion of the Christ the story of the last few hours of Jesus Christ's life. Through his agency, Icon Productions, he directed, produced, co-wrote and funded the film himself, spending $25 million of his own money. Very graphic and extremely violent, the film was met with a mixed response, many regarding it as anti-Semitic. Regardless, the controversial film raked in more than $600 million, becoming the eighth highest grossing movie of all time. It's probably about the hardest gig I've ever done in my life. And it wasn't as big as Braveheart with all the horses and people and stuff, but it was more, there were more precise things that had to happen in it. He was a brilliant mind. He's a photographic memory. He can learn at things at a glance. He has a great courage in making a film like this. But this is uh, the ultimate hero story for all mankind. He suffered, died, and he still won. So like, he came back to say, look, see, I told you I could do this. Mel is not just a great actor, he's also a great director, and he proved already that. And it doesn't happen very often to be both. He knows what he wants, and this is makes your work easier as an actress. At the end of any given day, I'm drained just from the sheer, uh, you know, just from moving. It's a, it's a very physical and emotional experience for me to try and, like, realize it and ha have it happen and create an environment for them where it can happen and not dictate too heavily because quite often, you know, you can... Uh, over, overdo it, you know? And you just have to stand back sometimes to just let stuff happen. Once you set it up, trust that it's just gonna be there and let it happen and trust the talent. After The Passion of the Christ, Mel directed Apocalypto, which dealt with the downfall of the Mayan civilization. Once again, he faced criticism, this time for portraying the Mayans as primitive people. But Mel still believed in his directorial vision. What I wanted to accomplish with it, I, I think I did and that's to provide not a filming experience for people, but an experience for people. I want people to understand the reality of the story. I want them to be taken through an experience. I want them to feel. After so much success, Mel's career hit a speed bump in 2006. He made headlines after being arrested for drink driving while partying in Malibu. And to make things worse, he was heard making anti-Semitic remarks during his arrest. 
He later admitted to suffering from bipolar disorder, depression and a lifelong struggle with the bottle. He apologised for his, quote, despicable behaviour and determined to clean up, checked himself into rehab, something he didn't find easy to do. It's a question of balance. We all have ego. I've got a big, healthy one. <laughs> um, it's just a matter of keeping him in abeyance, you know. Right. So slapping him down with a whip from time to time because uh, when he tends to take over, I tend to get into trouble. During that same year, Mel separated from his wife of 28 years and the mother of his seven children, Robin Moore. In early 2009, they divorced, carving up his $1.2 billion fortune in one of Hollywood's most expensive breakups. One month later, we were shocked when he revealed his new pregnant girlfriend, Russian musician Oksana Grigorieva. They are now proud parents of a baby girl named Lucia, making Mel a father of eight and an octodad. Proud father, talented actor and Oscar-winning director, Mel Gibson has definitely proved that when it comes to his professional and private life, we should expect the unexpected. Stay tuned to Star Picks for all of the movies you know and the actors you love, broadcasting glorious high definition with 5.1 surround sound where available. For more of the best in entertainment news, check out your movie network channels. It's all together better on screen and at mnc.tv.